And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. These words are just dripping with history and with significance. Jesus, of course, has just been baptised. If you remember from chapter 3, it's a while ago now, isn't it? But he's just been baptised and he's led out into the wilderness for 40 days. And he's greeted there in that desolate place by the devil where he is tempted. What is temptation? Why are we tempted? Who tempts us? Because we know what it is to be tempted, don't we? We know what it's like to be tempted. Temptation is when we are encouraged to go against God. And I think there's two key elements to it. Firstly, it's always against God's rule. Um, You can't be tempted to do good, only evil. And the second element is we are encouraged to do it with an incentive. Uh, We're given a reason, we're given a promise. If you do this, then you will get. And so it's not a, temptation isn't a command, is it? It's not a, a command to do evil. We're not made to do it. It's our own choice. But we are encouraged to make that choice with promises that entice us and make us want to do it. Who is it that tempts us then? Is it God? No, it's not God, is it? We just read in James that let no one say that when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God tempts no one. Well, who is it then? The devil? Yes, it's the devil. The devil is the one who tempts us. Why does the devil tempt us? What does he get from it, from just messing with us and tempting us? The devil is often portrayed and spoken about in uh, the media and popular culture. He's trivialised as a mischief maker. You know, this little guy with his little pitchfork and his little horns. Ah! He's just out to make things difficult, to mess with our lives. He's just out to cause chaos. But it's so much more than that. Boys and girls, this is so important. It's so much more than that. There's a deep purpose to the devil tempting you and enticing you to go against God. It's a war. It's a war over citizenship. The devil is trying to recruit you. He's trying to tempt you away from the kingdom of heaven and into his kingdom. How? By trying to show you how great his kingdom is. And the question is, will you believe him? Will you believe him? Temptation is not the work of a mischievous devil, some jaunty fellow who runs around putting temptation in your path. Oh, let's see what he'll do here. No. He is powerful and he is crafty and each temptation is set up carefully to draw you away to the next temptation and to the next until you're so far down a path you promised you'd never go down. Every moment we are tempted is an assault. Trying to turn your head away from Jesus and to the pleasures and treasures of Babylon. Look at this. This will please you. This will satisfy you. This will fill you. Come on. Come this way. I see it easy, does it? Jesus was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. It's just a bit of bread, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Look at my kingdom. Have a taste. This is what will fill you up. Wednesday is the beginning of the church season of Lent. It begins on Ash Wednesday. Uh, and people have all sorts of ideas uh, about what Lent is all about. Uh, but Lent isn't about, you know, losing a bit of weight, getting into better sleeping habits, watching less TV or whatever. It's war. It's war. 
Lent is war. During Lent, we state our citizenship. We validate our claim that we want the kingdom of God. Each week here, we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. In Lent, we're invited to live out that prayer and show what we believe. It's a time to train our minds and bodies and souls for combat, teaching our flesh to despise the kingdom of Babylon and find joy and life and satisfaction only in the kingdom of God. Read Luke chapter 4 carefully. We see that Jesus didn't go out into the wilderness too fast and the devil, seeing his opportunity, came to tempt him. No, Jesus goes out to be tempted, and so he fasted. Jesus, facing temptation, knows the only way he's going to face this temptation is by fasting. He fasts to face and overcome temptation. Well, Doug, that's not how it works for me. When I fast, I give in to temptation. I'm grumpy, I snap, and I lust for fleshy satisfaction. If we find that to be true, we're probably not fasting. We're just not eating. And there's a difference, isn't there? Fasting is not to test us, but to equip us. When we fast, the aim isn't just to get through the day having not eaten any food. We, we, we don't turn to our phone to distract us through it. It's no good just sleeping to get through it. What good is it to trade in one pleasure of Babylon for another. We use our fasting to turn our sight to Christ. Let your fasting train your body for combat. Focus on the kingdom of Jesus. Read and pray and above all, pray. Jesus fasts to overcome temptation. As we head into Easter, let me suggest that Lent is a really good time for us to do the same. To fix our eyes on Jesus and his kingdom and make the break from Adam. Cast your mind back. It's almost a year now. uh, February 23rd, 2020. Our first sermon in Luke. What was the big theme? Can you remember what the big theme of Luke is? Anyone? Oh, it's a test. Shall I tell you? One of the adults want to tell me? Come on, Viv. Fulfillment. That's it, fulfillment. Luke 4 is dripping with Old Testament fulfillment. Boys and girls, what do we mean by fulfillment? It's a complicated word. It's not a complicated word, but it's a complicated idea, isn't it? Um, We can think of it this way. Jesus has come to reverse and undo the Old Testament. Jesus' ministry reverses the actions of many in the Old Testament. So we begin with Adam, don't we? The Bible begins with Adam, the first man, head of the first humanity. What happens there? Adam and Eve turn away from God's kingdom. They give in to temptation and they follow the devil. What were they tempted to do? They were tempted to eat. Eat this fruit. You will not surely die. Adam and Eve were in paradise, weren't they? Uh, In the garden temple of the living gods. Every conceivable fruit of the earth was theirs to enjoy. They were not hungry. And yet they fell by being tempted to eat. And the very first hurdle, the first temptation, Adam and Eve fail. And they plunge humanity into death. But what we see here, in Jesus, as he fulfills and reverses that, he is the second Adam, Jesus, the head of this new humanity, this new kind of human life. He doesn't fail. And he doesn't fail in far harder circumstances. He's hungry in the wilderness with nothing to eat. Where Adam and Eve were in a lush garden filled with fruit and food. Adam fell by eating food that was not his to eat. Jesus conquers by refusing food that would dishonour the Father. Because Jesus 
is not living for this kingdom, this world. Jesus is the second Adam who shows himself to be the true Adam who pleases the Father. He also shows himself to be the true Israel. What happens with Israel? Well, God calls them out of Egypt. He names them his son. This is Israel, my son. He declares them to be his people. He baptizes them in the Red Sea and they are taken into the wilderness for 40 years. Do you see? Do you see the clear picture of what Jesus is undoing and fulfilling? Israel are taken into the wilderness and they fail. Why? Because they longed for Babylon. They longed for Egypt. They longed for the food that was there. They longed for food. They longed for other gods. And they test the Lord. And they say, are you even with us? Israel go into the wilderness and they fail. They give in to the temptation of the devil. Whereas Jesus, the true Israel of God, goes into the wilderness and succeeds where Israel failed. And it would be so easy, wouldn't it? It would be so easy to look at them, to look at Adam and Eve and Israel and go, nice one, guys. Jesus had to come and undo your mess. And he did. And he comes to undo yours too. You see, Jesus' baptism and wilderness temptations fulfills Adam and Israel, but it also prefigures our own journey through this fallen world. Jesus preemptively fulfills your life too. After our baptism, we make it onto the devil's public enemy number one list. He looks and he goes, look, that one has been birthed to new life. Let's get them back. I can still smell the Adam on them. Tell them how good Babylon is. Get them to forsake their Christ. Will you do it? Will you go there? Will you return to Babylon? This is the question that's been asked every single time you are tempted. There's a battle raging and Christ has already won. We just read about it. He's already won. So let's have a, a look at some of these temptations. Verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. No kidding, right? Understatement. It's incredible, isn't it? Jesus actually does this. 40 days without eating anything. It's not just poetic. He did it. He fulfilled what Adam and Israel couldn't. And we might think, well, yeah, well, of course he did. He's God, right? <laughs> um, God could do this. But this isn't a feat of power. It's a, it's a feat of belief. Jesus did not need his divine powers to get through this. And that's kind of the whole point. This is something any human could do. I looked it up. It's not beyond human capabilities to go 40 days without food. But it would have left him then completely emaciated, exhausted, empty, skinny. He would have taken several days afterwards to recover physically from this fast. He was in this condition when the devil comes to him in verse 3 and says, If you are the Son of God... Command this stone to become bread. Do you see those words? If you are. It's just the same in the garden. Did God really say? You see, the devil doesn't really deviate from his greatest hits too often. He first attacks the word of God. Did God really say that? Can you trust the Bible? Okay, but is that what he really meant? Does God really say that about men and women and gender and marriage and creation and hell? Did he really mean that you should sell your possessions and share with the church? Jesus had just heard his father's voice 40 days ago at his baptism. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And the devil says, are you sure? Are you sure? Because if you are the Son of God, you should probably not die. 
I don't think the father would like it if you died. That's what I come for. That's what I come for. I have come to die. What are you talking about? You see, the devil's got everyone else convinced that the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to you is that you lose Babylon. Either through poverty or illness or death. You don't want to lose all of this. And so Jesus, the only reasonable course of action is to eat. And we know it's not inherently wrong for Jesus to make bread out of nothing. He, he does it, doesn't he? When he feeds the 5,000, he makes bread out of nothing all the time. So what's the big deal, Jesus? If you don't eat, you'll die. It's the same temptation the devil often gives to us. The devil will try to give me the belief that I have the ability to go beyond what God has instructed me to do. Why? Well, because, Doug, you see the bigger picture. There's a bigger picture here. I know I'm not really meant to do this, but given the circumstances, I totally think God would be okay with it. As if I could see some set of circumstances that the living God had not considered when he gave me his commands. Obey the law of the land. Yeah, but I'm going to be late for church. And I need to be there to set up, so it's, it's okay if I speed a little bit. If I don't get some downtime, some, some me time, uh, some time in front of the telly, if I don't indulge in that unhealthily, then I'm just going to feel really low about today and really grumpy. And, uh, and that would be worse because, you know, the Lord does not want me snapping at the kids tomorrow. If I don't just take a little shortcut on my work here and just cut the corners a little bit, then I'm going to be at the office till late tonight and I'm going to miss time with my family and God does not want that. Prove you're a child of God and go beyond what God has commanded. He'll understand. He doesn't want you to suffer. Verse 4, Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And this is just brilliant. This is just brilliant. You see, it isn't power that enables Jesus to fast this long. It is faith, his belief, his complete trust in his Father. That's why he can do what we would think is impossible. Because he believes better than you and me. And look at who Jesus is quoting. <laughs> Anybody know who he's quoting? He's quoting himself. <laughs> Jesus is quoting Jesus to the devil. That's a really good tip. That's a really good tip. He's repeating what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, when, when Israel gave into temptation and doubted the provision of the living God. You see, the devil comes to us just as he came to Israel and Adam, and he's like, look, guys, come on, look at the situation. What are you going to do? If you don't do something, you're going to miss out. And we're like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. If I don't do something, I, I might lose my leisure. I, I might lose my income. I might lose the respect of my peers. Lose family time, lose money. I might lose my life if I don't do what you're suggesting. And the devil's like, mm-hmm, see, yeah, reasonable. And he tries it on Jesus. And Jesus is just like, oh, shut up. Shut up, devil. I don't even want that. I don't even want that. That's not going to work because I don't want what you're offering. You see, the devil is like a magician. A, a magician will always do a move first which will convince you of the trick. So, for example, he'll, he'll show you a pack of cards. Look, a perfectly normal pack of cards. It's not a normal pack of cards. But as soon as he's got you convinced it's a normal pack of cards, then what he'll do next, you'll believe. And you'll be amazed by what he does. It's like, look, Babylon is the best thing. Oh, yeah, no, it is. If Babylon's the best thing, then I'd better not lose it. And you'll buy into the one after it, you see? You need to expose the first lie. You see, Jesus grabs the deck. He's like, it's nonsense. They're double-sided. And he chucks them on the ground. I see through your lies. Babylon is not what I live for. How does he do this? He's fixed on the truth. He... he, he replies each time with the word of God, stating the truth. So the devil tries a new tactic. He tries telling the truth in verse 5. 
The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then worship me, it will all be yours. The devil's telling the truth here. Several places, the devil, Satan, is called the uh, prince of, uh, of, of the world. He's spoken about having authority over the world, that authority has been given to him. And so he says, the kings of this world have been delivered to me. Not sure exactly when, uh, but I suspect it's a reference to Babel and Deuteronomy 8.32, when the nations were split and the, yeah, given over there. But regardless, Satan is telling the truth. He can offer what he is offering. But the question is, what is he offering? It's been said that this temptation is a shortcut uh, to Jesus' mission. But it's not. It's not. Because the kingdom that the devil is offering is not the kingdom that Jesus has come to receive. You see, Jesus has come to receive a kingdom that he will form by his blood on the cross, by his body broken, by his resurrection and ascension. Satan is offering him a different kingdom, the kingdom of the world. He's offering him Babylon, not the kingdom of heaven. And we've been missing the significance of this if we think that all Satan is doing is going, look, you can have your little victory, you can have it, but you just have to bow. No, it's far further reaching than that. Boys and girls, what is it that Satan wants? Right from the beginning, what is it that Satan wants? He wants to take God's place. He wants to take God's place. He is setting up his kingdom against the Father's kingdom. And so what better way to take the Father's place to become a father than to acquire a son? He could take the Father's place in the Son's affection. Bow to me instead of him. I'll be your father now. He's trying to recruit the second person of the Trinity and have himself a satanic Godhead over his fallen world. He's already tried this tactic before in the garden with Adam. That's what he did. He took the Father's humanity. He can't make his own. So he tempts Adam, come with me, build a city better than Eden, Babel. And now he wants more, he wants a son. Bow to me, Jesus. But Satan can't get it. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. You see, the devil can't get a son. So what's his next target? Well, I'll get a bride. I'll get a bride. That's why the devil spends so much time in the church, trying to get believers to worship him. There's no trouble getting humanity. He's already got humanity. He wants a bride. Fine, Jesus, if you won't bow to me, just watch. I'm going to get your bride. I'm going to make her kneel before me, and I'm going to make you watch. Satan is snatching believers out of the kingdom of God. It's happening. We see it. We read about it. And he's putting them into his own vile kingdom. That's why it matters that you resist temptation. It's a war for citizenship. Every moment, boys and girls, you're tempted to be selfish. Every moment you're tempted to lie. When we're tempted to go beyond what God has said, when we rationalize our sins it's a big deal it's a big deal temptation is not trivial it's serious it's war and so we need to be prepared <clears throat> satan would love nothing more than to get his hands on this church he'll do it any way he can anytime he can convince you that babylon is best he will any moment you might think it's not a big deal but any moment you see it won't begin with me preaching outright heresy from the front here that's not how it begins it begins quietly with each of us at home in our own lives it begins with 
I don't really have time to read my Bible today because other things are more important. Babylon things are more important. I don't <clears throat> need to pray today. I've got too much on. Too much other things to do. What was I supposed to do? Not get angry? Not lose my temper? When they acted that way? I know mum told us to tidy up the room straight away. Uh, but doing what I want to do is better than obedience to God. This is going to bring me more pleasure. I know I should spend more time or some time praying with my wife. But, you know, I just need some me time. You know, I could get up early and spend an hour with Jesus before my day begins. But I think staying up late watching my programmes will actually bring me more joy. It's just a little bit of porn. I give enough money to church already. Church takes up enough of my time. I can't help everyone at church. Do you know what? I think I need Sundays for me. Does it really matter what I believe about gender, marriage, science, the resurrection? What can we do? We all know Christians who have been taken by Babylon, who have had their heads turned. Ministers, preachers who have fallen into sin and denounced the faith. It's no little thing. It's all out war. So prepare to fight. You see, the devil will only ever be successful in tempting us if we want what he promises. We are encouraged to disobey God with an incentive, a reason, a promise. But it only works if we believe the promise, if we believe the narrative, if we believe his story. So what do we need? We need a better story. Boys and girls, your experience of temptation will not be like Jesus's. It won't be as, seem as obvious as we read it here in the words. The devil is not going to appear to you in person. Oh, I haven't been tempted today. The devil didn't turn up. No. It will be the voice of your friends. Not that they mean it. It will be the voice of your teachers. It will be what you see on the telly. What you read on a screen. What we hear in the news. Everything in the world is stories. And it's trying to tell us one big story. That this is all that matters. This is why everyone's terrified of covid because the worst thing to do would be to lose all of this. Everything is telling you what is the best way to live, what you should believe. And the question is, what story are you going to trust? The story told to you by the, word, by the world, by the words of your friends and TV programs, or the story you hear every week in church, given to you in the word and given to you in bread and wine. Christ is risen. That is the story. It will be impossible for you not to hear the stories of Babylon. You can't block them out, but you don't need to believe them. When they lie to you, you don't need to believe them. How can we prepare for this battle then? We follow Jesus' example. Fix your eyes on the kingdom of heaven and believe. Read, pray, fast. Quote his words. Quote the scripture. Pray the scripture. Say those words out loud. Simply announce Christ's kingdom. Jesus died and rose again and he's coming back for me and he's coming back for you. Say those words once a day. It'll change your life. Announce your citizenship. Convince yourself. Say the creed. Confess to one another, brother, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to believe. Tell me about the kingdom. Tell me why I should stay. Tell me why I should go to Babylon, please. Do all of these things. But above all and in all, trust Jesus. Trust his work done for you. He has done what Adam and Israel couldn't and he has done entirely what you can't. So that you can. Cast your mind back. It's a while now since we've been in Jesus' baptism. Do you remember the significance of Jesus' baptism? How there in the water 
He joined us. That's where he joined us. That's where he took his, our sin upon himself. In the Jordan, remember, he's commissioned as the high priest. He's baptized, washed, and anointed with the Spirit. And he begins his intercessory role by bearing his people on his body, on his chest and on his shoulders, bearing the sin of the world. And so in the act of baptism, Jesus actually repents for you. He's repented for you and now he's carry, carrying you on his body. He resists temptation for you. He carries you out into the wilderness to face the devil for you, with you, carrying you. So that now, today, you can look there and go, temptation has been dealt with. I have faced all the temptation of the devil in Christ. I don't need to wonder today whether I am able to resist. Because it's already been resisted for you. It's actually already been resisted by you in Jesus. Christian, you are free not to sin. You are free to never have to sin again. Oh, but you're gonna. Oh, but we're gonna. Unfortunately, we are going to. But whenever you do, no. It's only because you've taken your eyes off Jesus, even for a moment. You've stopped believing in that moment. And in that moment, you believe the lie of Satan. And it's not as if there's no way back. There is a way back. You need to grab it straight away. As soon as it happens, as soon as you give in that lie, you need to remind yourself of the truth. You need to repent and repent quickly. Speak out loud the words of the kingdom. Fast, fix your eyes on his cross where he carried your sin and your shame and put them to death. In the name of Jesus. Amen.